Speaking of hurricanes, today we are in a talk that we're simply calling Heart Hurricane. Have you ever had a heart hurricane where it's like your heart just gets all kinds of jacked up? And I'm not talking physically, I'm talking about uh, the metaphorical angle of it, that you're just emotionally off. And it's like, what happened here? Uh, Today we're going to fill in one thing in our sermon notes and then we're going to do a pretty lengthy Bible study and hopefully make some applications from an individual that we see in scripture that had a real heart hurricane. And so hopefully you grab sermon notes. If you did not, feel free to step out and grab them in the back. Uh, You'll also be able to follow along on the screen. If you have your Bible, I want you to open with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be in the Old Testament. We're going to stay there the entire time. 1 Kings chapter 18. And uh, while you're starting to get there, there is one thing we're filling in our notes, and this is it. I think you can reduce heart hurricanes to two common factors, and that's hard news and hurt feelings. I think when you have somebody who has gone through some measure of heart hurricane, or they're in the midst of it, if we were to sit down and talk and wrestle through things, I think you can narrow it down to Hard news and hurt feelings. Hard news when it happens. You uh, didn't get the promotion or you lost the job or that, that area is being closed off or you, the medication is not going to work or a diagnosis that comes along. Uh, hard news could be something relationally. Uh, you know, you get... Something happens with your kids or with your spouse, and it's hard news. Um, It could be the passing of somebody. I think we all are accustomed and familiar with hard news that can come out of nowhere. And when hard news hits, for a lot of us, we don't know how to process it in the moment. And it causes us some form of bruising that causes us to question the Lord. Lord, why, why did you let this happen to us? Why did you let this happen to him or to them? Why, why are we going through this? We've been praying, we've been tithing, we've been trying, we've been serving, we've been going, we've been staying, we've been reading, we've been doing all these things. Why, Lord, really, why? Or maybe it's stacked on top of one another and you're like, really, like I can't handle any more? You know, why? It causes a question of him. Hurt feelings typically creates a fence and it causing us to question them. You can love somebody and start to question them once you're offended. A spouse offends you. A parent offends you. A child offends you. A boss offends you. A coworker offends you. And it causes you to question them. Do they really have my best intention in mind? Why, why are they going after me? What, why is this going on? And it causes a heart hurricane. I think when somebody's troubled in the heart, you can narrow it down to hard news and hurt feelings. And we're going to look at a guy that dealt with some of these in the scripture. Uh, before we unpack anything from 1 Kings, I want to show you the individuals we're looking at. The first is Elijah. Elijah that we're going to read about in just a moment, he is a prophet of Israel. And he is very renowned, and he's renowned for basically his boldness and the miracles that followed. It's one thing to be bold and have nothing to show for it. People classify that as just arrogant. But he is bold, and then there's demonstration of miracles that follow. He is able to execute the things of God in a really phenomenal way. And so he's one that we're going to look at. Ahab is the king of Israel. Now, Ahab, you have to know this. Ahab is a wicked individual, and not just a wicked individual. He's wicked towards the Lord. That's a whole different level. To be wicked in one platform and to be wicked towards the Lord, that's a whole different platform. For instance, don't turn there, we'll just have it on the screen. 1 Kings chapter 16 says, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He had not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and so those are sins amongst the people, uh, a turning away from the Lord, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. So pause right there. 
So not only does he not protect the worship of God, not only does he not protect the faith of his people, he institutes a temple to be built and then puts an altar in there and idols in there towards this God that Jehovah God has specifically said, that's an abomination to me. It continues on, Ahab also made an Asherah pole, which was to a whole different set of pagan gods, and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. So Ahab is very uh, wicked towards the Lord. Uh, The next person that we're going to see is Jezebel. And Jezebel is the wife of Ahab. Um, I don't believe that Jezebel became Ahab's wife based on romance. I don't think they were in a diner and Joe Cocker was playing, you are so beautiful. You know, I I think you have... Uh, some kind of affiliation, nation to nation, treaties. I think he is partnering with a uh, pagan nation for peace treaty, posting up a number of their uh, idols. And she comes in and she is very violent towards the prophets of God. Not only is she antagonistic against them, she's violent towards them. You're going to see that in just a second. And then the other guy that we're going to see is Obadiah. And Obadiah is a servant of Ahab, King Ahab. Um, He's very devout to the Lord. If you're familiar with your Old Testament, the book of Obadiah, Obadiah historians will say that the one that wrote the book of Obadiah is this same Obadiah. He is devout to the Lord. He's servant to King Ahab. And yet Jezebel doesn't really recognize that. And we're going to see that straight out of the gate in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. It says, While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets... Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and had supplied them with food and water. So she is trying to have all the prophets of Jehovah God and the scriptures, the Torah, uh, trying to have them eliminated. Obadiah is trying to preserve them, but this is at great peril to his own life and to their life, so it's a great secrecy, and he is making sure that they are safe in a variety of ways, and in two caves, so that if one is attacked, the others can uh, escape, and he's trying his best in order to preserve them. In between verse 4 and verse 16, Elijah is going to come to Obadiah, and he's going to tell Obadiah, I want to meet with the king. Obadiah is not going to want to do this. Obadiah is not going to want to go to King Ahab and say, Elijah wants to meet with you because he fears that the Spirit of God will take Elijah away. He just created a meeting with Ahab. Ahab shows up. No, Elijah takes out Obadiah. So Obadiah is against this. Elijah assures him, I will be there. I will be at this meeting. So Obadiah is going to go to Ahab and create this meeting. It says in verse 16, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to them, said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now pause right there for a second. Is that you, Elijah, you troubler of Israel? Now, why does he call him troubler? Israel was a very agrarian culture. They were dependent upon rain. And because the people had become so wicked towards the Lord, Elijah says, listen, you better get your act straight. People and king. Or the Lord's going to withhold some things. The Lord's going to withhold his blessing. And Elijah prophesies there's going to be no rain until there's some cleaning up here. And this prophecy, this execution of no rain extends for about three years, this really strong famine. And so Ahab wants to blame Elijah for this, although it's not Elijah that wasn't serving the Lord, it's Ahab that's leading it. So Elijah's response is going to be in kind with that. He says, I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now pause right there. He says, you go, Ahab, you go get all your prophets. Go get 
850. 450 for Baal, 400 for Asher. You go get them. And then not only that, you summon Israel. We're doing this today. No more of this extending. No more one day, someday. This is happening today. And so what ends up happening is Ahab is going to commission his prophets and there's going to be a summonings of all those that are able to travel to this region are going to travel and observe. This is going to be one massive public spectacle. It happens in verse 20. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And so what ends up happening between verse 21 and verse 26 is the arrangement of this showdown. Both the prophets of Baal and Asher are going to take one particular bull. They're going to sacrifice this bull. They're going to put this bull up on an altar, and they're going to call out to their gods to consume it with fire. And if their gods consume this bull with fire, well, then the people ought to worship their gods. And if nothing happens... Elijah's going to sacrifice his bull, put it up on an altar, and if that bull is consumed by fire, then the people should worship the Lord Jehovah God. And so this is prepared. It says in verse 26, So they, being the prophets of Baal and Asherah, took the bull, given them, prepared it. Then they followed this progression. They called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Pause right there. I'd say long church service. Like, I'm only going to talk for 21 more minutes. They're going all morning to afternoon. And there's going to be a ramping, a progression from calling to now we're going to start shouting. It says, O Bell, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. So the calling didn't do anything. So we're going to get active. We're going to start dancing, you know, bouncing around. We're going to try and summon through our activity. It says, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder. I don't think they can hear you. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. You know, maybe he's asleep, must be awakened. So just a really great taunting of them. Watch this progression. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Like when I get up and teach, I typically am talking in an almost conversational tone and sometimes I'll ramp it up, I'll get passionate and I'll kind of preach, go from teaching to preaching. I've never started slashing myself. (laughs) If you're not buying it, I'm not going to go to that extreme. And if I started slashing myself with swords and spears, you'd be like, Joel's whacked out. Like you would video it, post it on Facebook, and we'd never see you again. These people are taking it to the umpteenth degree. Nothing's happening. Now, Elijah is going to step up, and we're not going to hear the shouting. We're not going to see the dancing. We're certainly not going to see slashing. We're going to see, simply see Elijah pray, and then we're going to watch God act. In verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord is God, He is God, the Lord, He is God. Before Elijah stepped up, he had said, I want you, before I pray, I want you to saturate that bull with water. And so they got large jars of water, let's call them barrels, and it poured upon this bull lots of water. He says, dig out trenches, and a trench was dug around, and fill those trenches with water, and they did so. He calls for water a third time to be spilled out. There's so much water just cascading off of the sacrifice and through the trenches, and then he prays, and God sends down fire that just wipes literally everything clean. And the response is exactly how you and I would respond. There is a dreadful worship. The Lord is God. There's no mistake. There's no tippy-toeing around it. There's just a great, the Lord is God. And there's just great repentance that happens. And so three things happen following this. Elijah has all 
850 of these false prophets executed because they have been a great peril to the nation and they have really directed the nation into judgment and wrath of God. And so they are executed. Secondly, there's great public repentance that happens. The people across the board are repenting. The third thing that happens is that Elijah speaks to Ahab and says, the Lord is now going to send rain. So even though you're a wicked king, despite that, God is still going to bless his people. He's going to send rain, and the agrarian side of our livelihood is going to start to resurface. So you would think, great victory, all of that fantastic. Watch what happens in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Pause right there. To me, that's astonishing. That section is fascinating to me. And I also think it's a bit revealing of humanity in a lot of contexts. You have Jezebel, who isn't even there. She hears the word of it, and she sends one person to Elijah. One man, one messenger. He had just confronted 850 prophets. He had just confronted in front of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And he has one messenger meet him privately and say that Jezebel has said this. That her gods, the ones that were just defeated publicly and proved to be non-existent. That her gods will kill her Not you, they will kill her if you are not put to death within the next 24 hours. And because of that, he runs for his life. Because of that, he kind of almost loses touch with everything that had just happened. And he runs. He has, in my mind, what we could call a massive heart hurricane. Hard news, and I think we can push into hurt feelings, which we'll see in just a minute. But it is going to cause him to run and question whether the Lord is protecting him. If you look at verse 4, I think what is happening for Elijah, I think you can make a strong case that Elijah was having, follow me here, an interior collapse even amidst exterior victory. Let me push into that for a second. I think you can have an exterior victory happening and have an interior collapse happening. So everybody on the outside sees your home and it's like beautiful home. Everybody on the outside sees your kids and think great family. Everybody on the outside sees your job and think stable, solid, working professional, and inside you're collapsing. Inside, I'm getting discouraged. Inside, I'm getting depressed. Inside, I'm getting afraid. I think we can make a strong case that Elijah had an interior collapse, even amidst exterior victory. In verse 4, it says, While he, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. You pause and you look at that right there. So he gets word from this messenger, the, the, the queen has said this, that her gods are going to kill her if she hasn't somehow executed you within the next 24 hours. He travels more than a day's journey. He is already outside of the timeline of this threat. And yet he's still going to continue to run and be afraid. And he's so discouraged, so depressed that he's starting to frame himself in those that have never been faithful to the Lord. He says, I'm no better than any of them. I don't know if if you can identify with this, but when you get a heart hurricane, hard news or hurt feelings, the tendency is to start kicking yourself around. You know, I'm no better. 
You know, I'm not really strong in faith. I don't know that I really trust the Lord. That's exactly what Elijah's doing. He's really kicking himself around, comparing himself to everyone that's never been faithful to the Lord because the interior is like walls that are starting to crumble on the inside. What's going to happen is the angel of the Lord is going to meet him, is going to basically prepare a meal. I'm sure that was really good. He's going to prepare a meal for him and say, you need to eat this because you're, you're about to run. The Spirit of God knows he's about to run. And it says this in verse uh, 8. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days, 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. This is fascinating to me. The Lord knows that you're going to run, and he provides for you still, and uh, you eat of it, you're sustained, and you still run, and you run, he ran for 40 days, we're now into the 41st day, remember her threat had a 24 hour time period on it, and he's now 41 days into the running, and he's hiding in a cave, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, been with people in church community, brothers and sisters in the Lord, that on the exterior you would say, you've got a good family, you've got a vehicle to drive, you've got health, you've got a lot of the great exterior victory and internally crumbling and hiding in caves from the Lord. And so the Lord is going to speak to him and he's going to call him out and have a conversation with him. And it says in the word of the Lord, verse 9, and the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Pause just right there for just a moment. Some of you might need to personalize that. And I don't mean to be offensive and I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but it might be that the Lord is speaking to you today and say, what are you doing here, Joel? Why are you running from me? Why are you having a heart hurricane based off of hard news? I get it that some things have been hard, but why... Are you having a heart hurricane that you are questioning me? Why are you having a heart hurricane and questioning the people I've put around you? What are you doing here, Joel? And then he's going to put on display. He says, he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. His great accusation, I think, inside of that statement when he says, I'm the only one left, it's my opinion that you could get bruised feelings and offended heart right there because he is questioning why the Lord is doing this. Like, I did all of this for you, and why are you allowing this to happen? And then remember those prophets that were in hiding? None of them came to my aid. You remember all those prophets that were being sequestered and kept safe? Why didn't anybody come to me? I'm the only one. Hard news, hurt feelings. And so the Lord is going to talk to him here. The Lord God said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Follow me here for a second. He sends wind that is so powerful, more powerful than you and I saw in Irma. Irma did not take our homes apart. Wind that breaks rocks apart. So powerful that it would have been a demonstration of the authority and power of God. An earthquake, very powerful, very demonstrative, and yet God wasn't in it. Fire, you would think fire, because wasn't that what we just saw on top of Mount Carmel? He had seen fire come down by full display and demonstration of the power of God. And now he sees fire once again. And if you've seen fire in one context come from God, and you see fire in the next context, you would think God was that one, God is this one, but he wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the things of demonstration. He was in the whisper. See, let me push into some things. Sometimes you and I can be in such a way that our interior, we've allowed our interior to get a little weak, a little fragile, 
to where we are, follow me, dependent on the demonstrations. I've got to have you demonstrate or I'm going to be in a hard hurricane because I'm in hard news and I need to see that our, 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 our demonstrations might be the job. You take the job away, where are you, God? You take the finances away, where did you go, God? You take the health away, where are you, God? And those are nothing but signs. They're not God Himself. He gives us signs sometimes. He blesses us sometimes, but they're not Him. He can take those things away, and He's still holy. He's still perfect. He's still loving. He's still everything He has always been. But we can get so married to the wind and the earthquake and the fire and the demonstration. Elijah was a man that knew powerful demonstration. And his, I would argue, some of his connectedness to the Lord maybe had started to run side by side with the demonstrations. And it opens up the path to a heart hurricane. Why are you here? Like if you frame that in your own life, you know, what are you doing here that has caused you to run so far from the Lord? What has caused you to question Him? What, what has happened so badly that has caused you to question your spouse? What has happened so badly that has caused you an offended soul to question the people that God's put around you? This heart hurricane is an interesting thing. For us, it's things like a steady job. For us, it's that our family's in order. For us, it's things like, you know, that we have health. But we can, we can do just what Elijah did and find ourselves having great exterior victory and having interior collapse. Can I just challenge that all of those things that he's blessed you with, they're nothing but signs. They are not him. For instance, if we were to all get in a vehicle and we're all going to caravan to Atlanta, let's say, we're going to get on 75 and we're going to head north and we're driving and at some point we're going to hit state line and we're going to see this big sign, you've seen it, it's there, welcome to the state of Georgia. But we're not going to pull over and say, we've arrived. Yes, here it is. It's simply a sign saying you're headed in the right direction. It is not the city. We're going to keep driving. We're going to see Atlanta 135 miles away or 175 miles away. We're not going to pull over at that sign. We're going to actually drive into the outskirts, and the outskirts are going to have a sign, Atlanta City Limits. And we wouldn't pull over and say, we've arrived, we're here. We were just simply trying to get to the sign the whole time. We did all of this just to get to the sign. We would say, we want past the sign, we want into the city. But sometimes with the Lord, we just want to get to the sign. I just want to get to the job. I just want to get to the health, or I just want to get to this or that. And it's not Him. He blesses you with those things. He blesses us with opportunities. But we will have an interior collapse if we ever marry the signs to our faith. And start to judge Him when we get hard news. Or start to judge everybody around us when we have hurt feelings. You know this as much as I do. Our culture is so bent on offense. You say one thing and people are offended. And that's not just on the outside, like church people don't do that. It's in the church too. I mean, we do the wrong song. I'm offended at that song. If I wear a long sleeve shirt and you wanted me to wear a short sleeve shirt, I'm offended. It's amazing the offenses that can come for people. Where, where does that come from? The people in your home that get offended. The people in work that get offended. Where does that come from? Is that exterior? That's an interior collapse. That's an interior thing. So how do we handle it? I just want to give you two tips today. Because I don't think that any of us are exempt. I don't think any of us can matrix our way out of hard news like you're like, woo, 
Neo, you know, I'm going to miss it all. I think hard news is going to come for every one of us. I think there are times that there's going to be hurt feelings for every one of us. That's just the fact that you're human, rubbing shoulders with other humans. We're all sinners that miss the mark at times. I think there's two tips to help us. Number one is stay open to God. Number two is that we attempt to stay forgiving of others. What I mean by that, staying open to God, is I think if you and I ever get so close to the Lord that He has to give you this, whatever that sign, whatever that thing you're praying about, and He has to do that, and if He doesn't do that, well then I just don't know how I'll make it or why I'll worship or why I would pray. I think that bruising of your heart and your soul will cause you to possibly miss Him. That he can be right in front of you and you don't see it. Elijah was right there, had great exterior victory, and for that season, for that moment, was missing it. I think you can miss him. I do. I think you can get so locked into him having to do a certain thing that if he doesn't do it, it bruises us and it causes us to question him. I think the better posture is to simply stay open to him. That's not that we don't pray about things. We pray about certain jobs. You go on a job interview, you pray about it. You pray over your kids. You pray over all those things that you're praying about, we're praying about. Those are all appropriate, but we still stay open, Lord, whatever you want to do. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done in this situation. Whatever you want to do, I'm going to worship and I'm going to follow. I'm going to stay open to you. Number two is that I stay forgiving of others. Because I think when you start to get offended to a point that I can't forgive others and I'm not quick to forgive others, I do think you start to misjudge them. For Elijah, he misjudged the other prophets. He made the statement that I'm the only one, no others. And after God corrected him, he said, oh, by the way, to Elijah, he said, oh, by the way, I've got plenty of prophets that have never bowed their knee to Baal. He says, just because you don't see doesn't mean you're judging correctly. And sometimes, let's be honest, we can misjudge people in our own home. You can misjudge a parent. You can misjudge a child. You can misjudge a boss. You can misjudge a coworker. You can misjudge people. When we get offended, we typically misjudge where they're at and what they're going through. You think about Mary and Martha. This happened. Martha's busy, 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 and she misjudges what Mary's doing. Because she, I think you can make a case, was getting a little bit offended by her. A little bit of hurt feelings. Lord, tell her to help me like I'm helping you. And she totally misjudged the situation. Maybe you're here today and you're dealing with hard news or hurt feelings. If you're not, praise the Lord, but you will at some point. But that should not cause an interior collapse for us. That's why that series that we did, Sinking Ship, is so important. Discipleship, lordship, worship, scholarship. We want to make sure the interior of our life is strong. This morning, what I thought we would do is we'd close out with a time of prayer. If maybe you're not dealing with any facet of hard news or hurt feelings, and praise the Lord, you just talk to the Lord when we go to prayer. You talk to the Lord about, I just, Lord, I want to be open. I want to stay open with you, and I want to be quick to forgive. If maybe you're here today and you say, I am dealing with a heart hurricane. I have had some hard news. And that hard news is hard for me right now with the Lord. And truthfully, it's causing me to do a little questioning. I want you to talk to him about that. Because he's probably saying, Joel, what are you doing here? Why are you dealing with this? And you have a dialogue with him about that. And you say, Lord, I want to stay open. I don't understand why. I don't understand when. I don't understand how. But I want to stay open to what you have for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Maybe it's hurt feelings. And listen, I could go for a long time on this, and I won't. But there's degrees of hurt feelings. Somebody takes your parking spot, you get offended. That's an easy one to forgive. Somebody robs your house, that's a different level. Somebody is unfaithful in the family, that's a whole different degree. And so I understand that forgiveness comes in degrees and stages, but it also comes back to our heart staying open to forgive, having a posture of, Lord, I've got to forgive. It doesn't mean that everything is always rectified, but here's what I'll say about this. I know that vindication and apologies don't heal the heart hurricane. 
Apologies and vindication doesn't heal the heart hurricane. But when I'm before the Lord and I'm willing to forgive in His measures, then God can settle that storm on the inside. This morning, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. We're all going to take a moment to pray. I'm going to continue to talk because I have a microphone, but you feel free to phase me out. And you talk to the Lord. If you have some hard news or you have some hurt feelings, you talk to the Lord. If maybe you don't have any hard news or hurt feelings right now, still talk to the Lord about remaining open, staying forgiving. If maybe there's something you've got to release to Him, let's do it right now. Father, we thank You for this time. All across this room, we're standing on our feet. And we're coming before you. None of us are exempt, Lord. None of us are exempt from the possibility of a hard hurricane. They can all come from hard news and hurt feelings. And Lord, I pray specifically for those that are here that are maybe dealing with it. If somebody is dealing with some hard news, I pray that you would strengthen them today. Lord, that you would clear some of their vision to see you in the situation That you are faithful. Your word tells us you cannot be faithless. Your word says that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Your word says that you are greater than the things that we deal with. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen your children today to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickens our mortal bodies. I pray that you'd strengthen your children today, Lord. Lord, if there's hurt feelings in this place, I pray, Father, that they would be able to bring that to you. Not looking for apologies and vindication to answer what's on the inside. But, Lord, that there would be a release to you. And they might not be able to forgive on their own, but you'll help them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd help your children to release. And Father, as we prepare to go today, that it wouldn't just be today, but it would be into this week that we would walk in the things of the Lord and we would live our lives in such a way that your name receives glory. Lord, would you bless your people today? Would you strengthen your people? Lord, I pray for every single person in this room that you would strengthen them in soul today to walk in in the victory of God, both on the exterior and in the interior. Lord, we love you today. It's an honor. It's a privilege to be here, to hear your word, to speak your word. Lord, would you bless us as we prepare to go. In Jesus' beautiful name, and everybody said, amen. Amen.